The invention of the nuclear bomb changed the world. Looking at conventional weaponry, we can see that the most powerful non-nuclear bomb ever made is the US military's GBU-43B Massive Ordnance Air Blast Bomb, also referred to as the mother of all bombs. At 30 feet long and weighing in at over 21,000 pounds, it is one of the most destructive non-nuclear weapons in military history. The blast it generates is said to stretch for a mile in every direction, with an explosive yield of 11 tons of TNT. Now compare this absolutely massive explosion to the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The nuclear bomb had a 16 kiloton yield, coming out to be 16,000 tons of TNT. Even weaker nuclear bombs can be so much more powerful than any regular explosive we can come up with. Thus, you would think that those in possession of nuclear weapons would handle them with the utmost of care, as any mistake, any slip-up, could lead not only to the immense devastation of the country's own population, but potentially an escalation into a conflict between countries. The idea of the threat of the world coming to its nuclear end because of bombs being launched intentionally into other countries is bad enough, but the idea that it could be caused by an accident is much, much worse. Yet, as we'll soon find out, the handling of nuclear bombs in the decades after their invention was far from ideal. Since 1950, there have been 32 of these so-called broken arrow incidents, with some nuclear devices that have never been recovered. So keep your balance and your hands steady as we learn something new. The technical definition of a broken arrow is an unexpected event involving nuclear weapons that result in an accidental launching, firing, detonating, theft, or loss. Ever since nuclear weapons came into existence over 75 years ago, there have been at least 32 such events. Yet none has resulted in a devastating atomic explosion. This begs the simple question, how? Because there have certainly been many close calls. To understand many of the cases we'll be discussing, let's first explain briefly and broadly what happens inside a nuclear bomb when it detonates. Keep in mind, I'm simplifying this a bit. In a fission bomb, the radioactive fuels of the bomb are kept separately. At one end is a small sphere of uranium-235, while at the other end is an even smaller bullet-like shape of uranium-235 that has the explosives set behind it. Once a barometric pressure sensor determines the intended altitude has been hit, it triggers the explosives to fire the bullet down the length of the bomb until it hits the sphere at the other end, triggering the fission reaction, which then causes the bomb to explode. Now, we can move into some of the bigger incidents of broken arrows. At 11.50 a.m. local time on May 22, 1957, a B-36 aircraft was flying over Albuquerque, New Mexico. Accounts of what caused the incident vary, but what's generally accepted is that a crew member in the bomb bay was jolted by sudden turbulence. He grabbed a hold of the manual bomb release lever to steady himself, causing the weapon to fall through the closed bomb bay doors and plummet to the earth. The nuclear chain reaction necessary to set off the bomb did not occur because the bomb's fissionable plutonium component was still stored safely separately on board the aircraft. However, the device's conventional explosives that normally sit behind the bullet of uranium-235 still detonated, leaving a crater 12 feet deep and 25 feet wide on an uninhabited area of land owned by the University of New Mexico. The Field Command Division of the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project, responsible for recovery and cleanup operations, reported the incident's only casualty was a nearby grazing cow, and they found that the radioactive material did not spread beyond one mile of the crater. When the incident was revealed to the public for the first time in the 1980s, AHF board member Robert S. Norris, then a research associate for the National Resources Defense Council, remarked that the Mark 17 was at the time probably the most powerful bomb we had ever made. While it was lucky that there wasn't fuel on the bomb, you would think that there would still be some lesson to be taken from this, something that the military could gain from it to prevent future incidents but we're only just getting started. During the Cold War, it was part of the United States' strategy against the USSR to keep bombers armed with nukes in the air at all times, so in the event of a Soviet strike, we wouldn't be left without any way of retaliation. The goal was 15 minutes from an enemy launch to launch in retaliation. This was before the advent of submarines that launched ballistic missiles and intercontinental ballistic missile silos. From 1960 until 1968, America maintained that 15-minute ability to pepper the globe with nukes by putting pilots on a 24-hour alert. 
For more than a decade, hundreds of US pilots crisscrossed the planet in planes loaded with nuclear bombs. And that's why a B-52 bomber was flying over Goldsboro, North Carolina on January 24th, 1961. The operation necessitated that the aircraft be refueled in mid-air. So at midnight, going from January 23rd to January 24th, the B-52 rendezvoused with a tanker to refuel. The tanker crew observed that the aircraft was leaking fuel from its right wing and notified its commander. They were then instructed to assume a holding position until most of the plane's fuel was lost and prepare for an emergency landing. However, the leak quickly worsened, and as the plane descended, the pilots began to lose control of the aircraft. At that point, the crew attempted to eject. Of the eight crew members on board, five were able to parachute to safety. The other three were killed. The crash resulted in the release of two three to four megaton hydrogen bombs. One of the bombs fell straight down and crashed into a muddy field at a rate of around 700 miles per hour, plunging the weapon deep into the ground. Its tail was found 20 feet below the surface, and though complete excavation of the weapon was abandoned, much of its nuclear material was recovered. Some uranium remains at the crash site, where the US Air Force performs regular inspections to test for the radioactive contamination. To date, however, no radiation has been detected. The second weapon's landing is still controversial to this day. Unlike the first, the second bomb's parachute opened, indicating that its arming sequence had initiated. Eventually, the bomb's parachute got stuck on a tree, leaving the weapon mostly intact. Today, experts differ on how close the weapon came to detonating, and how many of the arming procedures it underwent. One analysis holds that the weapon only did not detonate because its arm safe switch, controlled by the pilot, was still set on safe. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, however, reported that, by the slightest margin of chance, literally the failure of two wires to cross, a nuclear explosion was averted. A 1969 expert analysis reiterated that point, saying, one simple dynamo technology low voltage switch stood between the United States and a major catastrophe. A road marker labeled nuclear mishap in Eureka, North Carolina, a town three miles north of the crash site, commemorates the incident to this day. This was still an early era for nuclear technology. The techniques for handling such explosive devices were still being developed, but in the eyes of those involved in the Cold War, there was no time to lose. Any time the nukes weren't in the air was time that the Russian threat was growing ever larger. The hastiness and geopolitical tensions would only lead to more mistakes, more broken arrows. On the morning of January 17th, 1966, a B-52 bomber carrying four Mark 28 hydrogen bombs collided with a KC-135 refueling aircraft near Palomares, Spain. The B-52 was part of the United States Air Force's Operation Chrome Dome, in which the Strategic Air Command constantly flew bombers armed with thermonuclear weapons in order to provide the U.S. with a first strike capability over the USSR in the event of a hot confrontation. While flying at an altitude of 31,000 feet, the B-52 bomber approached the KC-135 tanker for a routine serial refueling at around 10.30 a.m. However, the bomber's incoming speed was too fast and caused the aircraft to collide with the tanker's refueling boom. Major Larry G. Messenger, one of the B-52 co-pilots, recalled, All of the sudden, all hell seemed to break loose. The collision caused an explosion that ignited the tanker, killing all four crew members on board. The B-52 started to break apart, and its unarmed thermonuclear payload, four 1.5 megaton bombs, were released. Three of the hydrogen bombs fell to the ground, while the fourth landed in the Mediterranean Sea. Of the seven crew members aboard the bomber, four ejected and parachuted to safety, while the other three were killed. Manalo Gonzalez, a local villager, recounted, I looked up and saw this huge ball of fire falling through the sky. The two planes were breaking into pieces. Debris from the collision fell down on polymers, but fortunately no one in the town was killed. Approximately 24 hours after the collision, U.S. servicemen and disaster control teams located, secured, and recovered the three hydrogen bombs that fell on land. One bomb deployed its parachute as designed and land harmlessly, in what former Secretary of the Air Force Thomas C. Reed called a silent testimonial to the care of those who designed, engineered, and built those U.S. nukes. However, the conventional explosives in the two other bombs went off, contaminating the surrounding farms. The fourth bomb that parachuted several miles off the coast landed in the Mediterranean Sea. The U.S. Navy launched an intensive three-month search, involving nearly 12,000 people, several ships, and two submarines. On March 2nd, the United States was forced to publicly announce the incident and disclose the ongoing search for the missing hydrogen bomb. 
Six days later, U.S. Ambassador to Spain, Ingear Biddle Duke, went for a swim in a nearby beach to prove that the water was safe. He told reporters, If this is radioactivity, I love it. The bomb would be ultimately found and extracted from the ocean on April 7, 1966. The following day, reporters were permitted to take pictures of it aboard the USS Petrel. The New York Times reported that it was the first time the U.S. military had displayed a nuclear weapon to the public. The U.S. military would then launch Operation Moist Mop in Palomares to remove contaminated soil from the bomb's release of plutonium. To clean it up, they decided to remove the contaminated dirt from the most contaminated areas. This involved removing topsoil from irradiated areas and shipping it to storage facilities in the United States. Over the course of four months, more than 1,400 tons of soil across 650 acres of land was sent to an approved storage facility in Akin, South Carolina. Additionally, medical treatment centers were set up to monitor the residents that had been exposed to the plutonium. In the immediate wake of the incident, the U.S. settled claims with the residents of Palomares for $600,000. In more recent years, a number of U.S. servicemen who participated in the cleanup have alleged that their exposure to plutonium has resulted in lifelong health problems. Part of the area still remains fenced off. In 2006, the Spanish Center for Energy Research discovered radioactive snails in the area. Subsequent analysis have continued to detect levels of plutonium in the soil. Another 2006 report revealed that the Spanish government believed the remaining contamination might be more serious than heretofore believed, and that the U.S. had spent $12 million to assist the Spanish in monitoring the contaminated area. Many of the broken arrows occurred during this heightened tension of the Cold War, when both sides of the conflict were constantly trying to one-up each other. The show of power and the sheer number of nuclear weapons at play meant that the odds of something going wrong were much more likely. The three cases I mentioned were far from the only three, but they also were on the more extreme end of the spectrum. Presumably, the safety measures behind the activating and arming of a nuclear bomb have since much improved from their early days. And with the advent of nuclear missile armed submarines, we don't have as much of a reason to fly them over our heads constantly anymore. What isn't as comforting, however, is the fact that we largely only know what happened in the United States on their side of the conflict. Less clear, however, is what may have happened on the USSR side. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video or learned something you didn't know before, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. And thanks again, and I will see you in the next one.